Coming up on Network Africa. 23 soldiers killed by Islamist militants in a big ambush in Niger. Over 7 million citizens registered to vote in Senegal's presidential poll coming up this Sunday. Plus, the Longway Hospital inundated as government reports Morrison conjunctivitis outbreak across Malawi. I'm Layo Olangi. At least 23 soldiers have been killed by Islamist militants in Niger. The Defense Ministry says 17 others were injured during an attack in the northwest of the country. Over 100 armed men on motorbikes used improvised explosive devices and suicide bombs to ambush the military unit as it was making its way back from an operation in the Tilaberi region. The ministry say, says uh, 30 of those attackers were killed. Now, following last year's coup in Niger, the country's military rulers severed ties with its Western allies. French forces, who had been leading an international fight against the jihadists, were forced to leave. Last weekend, the authorities said they were also cancelling an agreement allowing U.S. troops to be based in Niger. And after much delay and uncertainty, Senegal is set for its presidential poll this Sunday, March 24. It's a crowded field of over 15 in the battle for the top job seeking to succeed President Macky Sall. Now, two men, including the recently freed opposition politician Basiru Faye and the ruling party's candidate Amadou Ba, are the top candidates likely to win over voters in the presidential election. There's also a woman in the running, Anta Babaka. She's Senegal's only female presidential candidate. Uh, about 7.3 million Senegalese have registered to vote in this year's election, and that is touted as the most unpredictable, and observers expect a runoff between leading candidates. Over in Algeria, the president, Abdel Majid Taboun, has brought forward the presidential election date by three months. The presidency announced on Thursday that Mr. Taboun has scheduled the polls for the 7th of September without uh, providing an explanation for holding the election earlier. Now, the election was previously expected to be held in December. 78-year-old Mr. Taboun is yet to announce whether he will be running in the election his term is due to expire in December. He won 58% of the vote to secure his first term in December 2019. Uganda's President Yoweri Museveni has made some changes to his cabinet, promoting his son, General Muhizi Kainerugaba, to head the military. The 48-year-old's promotion comes amid a major cabinet reshuffle in which five ministers have been sacked. He now replaces General Wilson Mbadi as the head, uh, as head the, of the country's defense forces, now his predecessor moving to head the trade ministry. Two of General Kaine Rugaba's closest advisors have also been named as ministers in the reshuffle. President Yoweri Museveni has been in power since 1986. The 79-year-old has denied speculation that he is grooming his only son as his successor. His son is a controversial figure in the country, becoming increasingly getting involved in the political arena in breach of the military protocols. In 2022, his father sacked him as commander of the army's land forces after he made threats uh, to invade neighboring Kenya. President Museveni had to issue an apology to Kenya's leader and also asked Kenyans for forgiveness on behalf of his son. To health matters now in Malawi, several patients are waiting to receive medical attention at the Baila Hospital's eye clinic in Malawi's Lilongwe district amid reports of a surge in conjunctivitis among locals. Doctors performing eye examinations on the patients and handing out uh, prescription medications say they have been inundated with many people suffering from the eye disease. A health 
Ministry spokesperson describes the situation as worrisome, noting that 7,000 cases had been reported this month, with the Karonga district, Lilongwe, and Kata Bay worst affected. The ministry is advising the public to avoid touching their eyes and sharing personal items such as towels and pillows. Officials have also urged locals to cover their mouths when coughing or sneezing while imposing a ban on handshakes to be able to stem the spread of infection. It's worrisome that for about uh, a month or so, we've accumulated a total of about 7,000 cases, with Karonga, of course, topping the list, uh, supported by Lilongwe, and then Katabe and other districts for pink eye diseases. Um, no history of, uh, of it being fatal. Um, but it can still cause several other complications, like uh, we've heard of people using um, unconventional medicines and thereby damaging their eyes, some getting completely blind. According to the World Food Programme, WFP, the conflict-driven hunger crisis in the Democratic Republic of the Congo is worsening as violence in the eastern province surges, forcing families to flee once again. More and more people are arriving at overcrowded camps where there is a lack of food, sanitation and shelter. In DRC, WFP says emergency response in the east has tripled its beneficiary reach from an average of 400,000 people in May 2023 to an average of 1.3 million people. Nearly 1 million others have been displaced due to the conflict that started uh, this year, leading to food shortages and increased commodity prices in the markets. For three years, people have been uprooted from their homes, from their land, not once, not twice, but multiple times. We, as the World Food Programme, we have to be there to give food assistance, to give cash, to make sure that these families don't face hunger, these mothers don't turn around and say, I have no food to feed my children. And we also have to keep telling the international community, don't give up on these people, don't ignore these people, and don't let this situation be tolerated. The UN Development Programme and World Meteorological Organization uh, has launched the Joint Global Action Campaign called Weather Kids. This is also in collaboration with UNICEF leading up to the World Meteorological Day. Broadcasters and online platforms across the globe aired a different type of weather forecast presented by children and showing a projected forecast for 2050 if uh, the world does not take climate action. The campaign directs uh, to the Weather Kids website and asks people to take a pledge for climate action in the name of a child and also to learn more ways how actions can be taken for future generations. UNDP says without accelerated action, children born in the year 2020 could experience up to seven times more extreme weather events. I'll take a look at a snippet of the weather forecast brought to you by a child. From up there to down here, everything is crazy. If we don't listen to scientists, things are going to be even crazier when I grow up. Let's look at the forecast for 2050. Heat waves will affect 94% of children, making playing outside a thing of the past. Without accelerated climate action, children born in the year 2020 could experience up to seven times more extreme weather events, like scorching heat waves, during their lifetimes compared to their grandparents. This new Weather Kids campaign is part of our response to listen to and act upon the growing concerns of young people across the world for their rights and their futures. If you're a kid today, you're, you're 10 years old, by the time you get to 2050, you're in your mid-30s. And the way the climate has changed will affect the food you eat, the jobs you have, will affect your ability to travel around the world, it will affect everything. And so it's really important that adults today are keeping that in mind. Well, here in Nigeria, the National Coordinator of Livestock Productivity and Resilience Support Project, a World Bank-assisted project, Mr. Sanusi Abubakar has pledged to support livestock farmers in Enugu to be able to boost livestock production in the state. Mr. Abubakar, during a cut sea visit at the government house in Ugo explained that the project seeks to improve productivity and commercialization of livestock value chain 
as well as address systemic weaknesses and challenges stifling the needed growth and full emancipation of the livestock sector in the state. Based on performance, as we move implementation, the state that implement fast and properly, the activity can receive more funds. We don't have any we think that any group can be part of the most performing performing state by closure, thanks to what we did uh, for Apple like at the beginning. And we are lucky that we are at the starting point, so we'll review all the aspects of the project, see where the bottlenecks are, and before uh, leaving the country, the state today, we'll find a way uh, uh, and uh, agree to the significant measure to help the team move forward. For the State Deputy Governor, Mr. Ifani Osai, government will play its part in every partnership that would create trackable value for the state and for the people. On our part as government, we are minded to do the needful. So we are minded to play our part in every enduring partnership that creates value for our state. But again, we want to work with you closely to ensure that whatever investment you make, which we support by the contribution we've made in counterpart for you, that we have trackable value to our people that is measurable, that we can access that everybody can say yes. Both El Press and NBC government works together to leave a legacy for the people they've served. And on your part, we expect you to do much more for us. It's good to have beautiful sessions as we are having. Mm -hmm. But as you all know, we don't grow livestock in the conference room of the deputy government. <laughs> we grow livestock in the farms. And as deputy governor, I'm happy to go with you to the farms to see the actual livestock production. Because at the end of the day, the sum total is that we should be able to increase the value and volume of livestock production in our state. On our part, we are minded to do that. Let's take you back now to our leading story for today. Malawian doctors overwhelmed with the outbreak of conjunctivitis in the country. Joining us now is Clement Msiska, who's a Malawian journalist with Capital Radio. Thank you so much for your time, Clement. Do talk to us about the situation of things at this time. Health officials are saying, you know, with 7,000 cases, that, that is quite the number. Clemens, I'll need you to unmute your mic. We appear to be having some audio difficulties with Clemens. We'll try and reconnect with him, but we'll take a break now on Network Africa, still ahead. We catch up with the Nigerian globe trotter Pelumi Nubi as she continues her London to Lagos solo trip. Not sure where she is at the moment. Do stay with us to find out after the break. Welcome back to the program. We're keeping tabs on Nigerian globetrotter Palumi Nubi has been on a solo trip moving with her vehicle from London to Lagos. This is a trip she began on the 31st of January through Tad and Utah roads, ferrying her vehicle across the Atlantic Mediterranean Sea to Africa and has been documenting her travels on social media. Palumi has gone through the motions on this trip. She has been excited discouraged, exhilarated and relieved. This is not the first time she has embarked on a long distance trip. Before her current adventure, she had completed the Lagos to Ghana route twice by car and explored the country of Namibia on a two-week journey. Well, she has also driven from London to Lake Como in Italy. She spoke to Channel's television in London uh, back in January before the start of her latest adventure. 
Take a listen. Safety being a Honestly, I just wanted to show that this kind of travel was very possible for someone that looks like me and really inspiring the next generation of travelers that they can step out of their comfort zone and do incredible things. And one thing about traveling is I extrapolate towards your life and you can take those lessons and use it. So I really just want to inspire um, people to get on the road, to get adventurous, to step out of their comfort zone and showcase Africa in a way that has not been done in a lot of like, you know, um, mainland media and just being able to say this is my experiences. Okwelumi joins us now from Cote d'Ivoire where she's still a few thousand miles away from London. Hello Okwelumi, good to speak with you. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Now you've been on the road yeah, since the road. January, you took off from London. Are you still as excited as when you first started out? You know what? I when I was taking off, I thought I couldn't be more excited. I, I felt like I had reached the, you know, highest peak. But I am even more excited because this has moved from just me solo driving from London to Lagos to a community movement whereby a lot of people have joined this journey. We are talking hundreds of thousands. So it has been so exhilarating like the joy and the excitement is off the chain right now <laughs> indeed i mean a lot of people have been following your social media platforms uh, following from one country to the other but there have been few bumps on the road i know when you were about to enter Sierra Leone, you were denied entry yeah so do share with us what happened and you know how you overcame the challenges you faced I always tell people that, look, traveling is like life. With life, there's up and down, and so is traveling. It's a, it's a, it's a really good ref reflector. Um, I was got to Sierra Leone, and there was a change of rule, which has been standing, but it said that, you know, right-hand vehicles could not go into the country. And my car being from the UK is a right-hand drive compared to, like, you know, when you get within the West Africa, where they drive on the left. Um, so when I arrived, I was trying to explain to them that, you know, there's also a bylaw that say if it's just a transit, you should be able to travel through, especially being an ECOWAS citizen. So just having to break down that, and that's, I guess, the joy of having, like, the research before, the, before embarking on this trip, that, yes, there's the law, but there's also, like, you know, also beef that needs to be put into consideration that this is not just me coming to stay in the country, but I was also just passing through to go to my next destination. So it got a transit um, that allowed me. So it was an upsetting situation, you know, a frustration but from different places, um, but we got through it. And obviously with the, with the community too as well, having them on my, on my side and, you know, trying to connect me to whoever could help out. And at the end of the day, I was able to get favor from one of the officers that understood, you know, where I was coming from. I was allowed, allowed, me, allowed me to go through. And, you know, a lot of us are cheering you on. But what has been your motivation that has kept you going? I mean, despite all these huddles, I remember you speaking to our correspondent in London back in January that this is not just a drive for you, you that you wanted to, you know, experience each destination. How has that been so far? It's been incredible, honestly. I have just really enjoyed the fact that I'm not just driving through. I am able to culture immerse myself, have local experiences, and, you know, being celebrated here even Sierra Leone by locals, you know, the local drums, people coming out, shifting from the online community I've been able to build to real life people, you know, living there, you know, coming after work with such short notice. So it has been that, you know, hearing feedback, like, you know, literally, you know, from a teacher that in my classroom, your page is almost a curriculum. Like we go through it, we see the holidays you've been through. It's almost an inspiration to the next generation. So it has kept me going, knowing that a lot of people are watching me, watching my journey and really proving to them that this thing they once thought was impossible is now very much possible right in front of their eyes. Uh, and Palumi, 17 countries, you and you've explored about uh, 11. Uh, you know, before coming on air, many people who knew we were going to speak to you were asking, how did you manage with your safety going through those, uh, you know, the roads and at night in the daytime? How were you able to manage your safety? I think definitely, like I said, a lot of research went into this trip and just kind of picking up from locals, you know, some locals are like, you know, maybe don't go through this path, maybe choose this alternative road, maybe there's road work working here or there. So there's definitely just, you know, listening to feedback of the people on ground too as well. And just, you know, playing, being street smart, like, as you know, like you pointed out yourself that, you know, I've been traveling for quite a while. I'm well-traveled, 
reached out to over 80 plus countries now. So using those experiences and, you know, engagement with people has really helped with the journey tremendously. And I think that's literally what I'm trying to show that as a woman traveling solo, you know, you do have to have that extra safety or that extra layer of, you know, safety consideration, but it shouldn't stop you. You should go out there and, and seek adventure. And you, you are, you know, trying to make history as the first black woman to undergo uh, this journey. Now we have a couple of weeks away. You have a couple of weeks away from Lagos. Are you excited about coming to the motherland? I'm sure you are. But how significant, you know, is it for you to drive into Lagos? It's. Uh, each time I try to imagine it, I, I get goosebumps because it's just been such a tremendous journey, you know, showing people the parts and all of that. And then to get to this finale, and I hear it's a homecoming, like people have rallied up. It's happening on the 7th of April. University of Lagos will be welcoming me in a grand style. So if you are around, please do come out. There are t-shirts available too as well. So it's really going to be a visual representation of, and there's so many naysayers when I started this trip, like she cannot do it, it's impossible, you know. So to be able to actually have that, in person um kind of like in the flesh evidence i think it will inspire people in, on so many levels like one thing i've considered impossible now i've seen Pelumi do it maybe you know i can reevaluate other things i have considered impossible at one point in time so this is going to be a a landmark event that i am i am just humbled to be part of like it's so exciting that <laughs> and three of them, I was like, oh my God, come out <laughs> and cheer me on. And I'm so excited to be home. I can't wait to hug my family, hug the people that have been there right from day one. And I know a lot of people who are excited for you as well. But, you know, have you talked about what happens next? What, what, what next for Pelumi when you eventually come in? And any advice for anyone who wants to explore just like you? Honestly, I'm, I'm this kind of person that wear a lot of horse blinders. Like, I'm very focused on the goal. The goal is to finish in Lagos. But like you said, a girl can dream and she can really put herself out there. I really want to, you know, see the next generation be be on this path whereby they are able to see an example of someone who have done such an adventure and they can step out of their comfort zone too as well and this can be put into business into like speaking engagement filmmaking books they, they, it feels like the for me to say this is exactly what i want is almost limiting myself because honestly the sky is beyond the limit like it's, it's gonna be amazing and i'm so excited for all the opportunities that are already coming in um, and I cannot wait for what the future holds. And for whoever wants to start, honestly, I always tell people, it's one of my biggest motto, start your journey. The magic is in the doing. You know, if I've owned an R, we will not be where we are right now, which is so close to the finish line. So yeah, if you want to start something, go for it. No matter what other people have to say, they will always have an opinion, but you need to do it for yourself. And that's what I've done. And it's been an incredible journey so far. Indeed, very encouraging words there, Palumi. And we wish you all the best, even as you go into other countries and eventually land in Lagos, Nigeria. Thank you so much, Palumi Nubi, our Nigerian Globe Trusser, currently on her London to Lagos trip. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Bye bye. And that's where we end the program for today and for the week. Thank you so much for always being a part of it. I'm Lalo Olandi. Have a lovely weekend.